Yeah, I mean, a clean sheet against Manchester United. Never easy, even though this is a, an off-colour uh, Manchester United at the moment. Um, still, it's, uh, it's something to, to, uh, to be very proud of. Uh, and they hardly looked like scoring, did they? They marshalled them really well. And, and when, you, when you're going forward, when you're playing well going forward as well, um, that takes a lot of the pressure off your defence. You know, you, they can keep the ball, they dribble, they you know, do all things in the, in the final third and all of a sudden it makes the night a little bit more comfortable for you. So every different area of the pitch is working for Palace at the moment. Suffice to say, though, Manchester United helped them with the way they conceded those goals tonight. Yeah, they did, and I think Mike, Michael made a good point there. Manchester didn't really look like scoring tonight. I'm trying to think of chances. They had a couple of headers from Casemiro, but that was about it. But again, it, this was all about positional play. We, we did that. I did this at half time. Ericsson, Pitch, Mainu, not having enough desire. And then when Ericsson makes that mistake, Casemiro, I reckon that could have happened four or five times that Casemiro sits down and somebody skips past him. And look, the, the lad's not a centre half, and it, it's tough to have a bit of a pop out who's done so much for the game. He's you know, a fantastic footballer. And it's, it's difficult watching a few of these, actually, because you do feel they're coming towards the end. They shouldn't really be at a club of this stature now, really. Uh, I think the next few years going forward, they'll be somewhere else. United look leggy. They looked like an oldish team. There wasn't really much legs about them. There wasn't really much positional sense about them tonight, which again was worrying. As I said, the two midfield players for, for Crystal Palace, they hardly moved. I, I, I can't think of them being in, our, being in a, the opposition box. And, and you, you saw United. Look, Ericsson's up here. Mine who's down there. Mason, I'm not, I'm not quite sure where Mason Mount was playing. And again, it's difficult to be critical of Mason Mount because he, he's just not played any football. But I think that comes down to coaching. You saw United could not really, in open play, they couldn't create chances. They've got a centre forward there, Man United. It makes your blood boil that centre forward forwards, man, they're not even getting chances. Rasmus Hoyland, I've watched him the last seven or eight games. I know he scored one goal. He doesn't get a chance in a game. I asked Michael before, do you think if you played in this team, do you think you'd get chances? The answer was no. I, I think he would. Because there's still quality. You think of Christian Eriksson. What a player. Mainly we know he's a good footballer. These players, but... Scalzi, the manager about a week ago, said they're the most dynamic team in, 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 in the UK or something. Came out with a quote about a week ago saying, you know, we're, we're great to watch. We're a dynamic team and, and all the rest of it after the game against Burnley. I mean, I don't know what, I, what game I'm watching. They, they suck the life out of, of you. As if, if, you're, if you're a Manchester United fan watching this, there's nothing that you can cling on to, is there? There's nothing, there's, there's not a player, there's, not a, there's no sparks, there's no chinks of light where you think, ah, yeah, OK, well, you know, I'll, I'll be a bit more, you know, a bit more perseverance, a little bit more patient, and uh, I can see something happening here. It just feels like it's getting worse and worse and worse, and eventually you just can't... Take any more? I'm sure you can't if you're a Manchester United fan. I, I, I'm not sure. This. I'm not sure the meaning of dynamic is, is, is what it means. I, I, I think when you watch that, I presume for a neutral watching, it can be quite entertaining because they do create a lot of chances. Or what well, they haven't tonight, but in games they have created a lot of chances. The big problem is they look like they could concede five or six in every single game, and five or six. Is being quite nice. It, it could be a lot more. They're conceding so many chances. It's so easy to play against. And look, uh, where, where, where do you go from here? We keep saying about there's probably six players who are missing who would be playing. But still, that team that is out there tonight, that performance, as we all know, it's look, it, it's un, unacceptable. It, it's sad. It's it, it's, disapp it's disappointing to watch. But what do you expect from a lot of players who are they're coming to the end? Again, Casemiro. Uh, he's, he, he's at fault for virtually every goal, isn't he? That last one he was at fault for. That one he's at fault for. The, the goal first one well, he's Michael, at fault for. The goalkeeper. The, the ball goes in the middle of the goal virtually here. It's incredible. I, 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 I just don't know where yeah. there's any positives. So, so where? I, I don't know what you put that, that down to when you've got a man with such experience, won what he's won in the game and... This is the best what angle. This see? virtually goes in the middle of the goal. I mean, the goalkeeper doesn't even get any, anywhere near it. 
I just, I'm just failing to see any positives at all about, about this at the, at the moment. Well, let's see if Eric Ten Hag's got any, because here is the post-match reaction of the Manchester United manager. Eric, not for the first time, Manchester United this season have been on the end of a disappointing result. But how disappointing a performance was that for you tonight from your team? Oh, it's clear and it's obvious. Um, this is underperforming. And uh, uh, we didn't uh, act how we want to do it. And it's by far not good enough. So yeah, we are very disappointed by this. And uh, the fans were all the way uh, behind us. And we should have keep fighting like the fans did. It's not the first time either you've had to stand in front of me or some of my other colleagues and answer these questions. But what do you put it down to when you say your team is not good enough? Is that the players not adapting to what you're asking for them? Is it a lack of belief from them? How do you assess it? So there are always reasons. <laughs> Everyone see our back line and there we have huge problems. But yeah, in the end of the day, we have to deal with it. And then we should have done better than as we did. Looking at the first goal that you conceded tonight, your two central meal fielders are ahead of the ball. Is that a position that you're asking them to take up or is that something that they're doing of their own initiative? Uh, there were five players and uh, such a goal that shouldn't happen. And because we really give clear instructions how we should defend this and uh, they just they didn't bring it on the pitch and we got hammered. And, but uh, there was one issue, but also on the left side, uh, there were two players doubling up on one, uh, on one player, and so that's very poor defending. I think it would be wrong to single out individual players. You're clearly making it clear that it's a team responsibility, but when you look at a player of the stature of Casemiro and you see at this moment how he appears to be struggling, what do you put that down to? As you say, you can't put this to one player. Eh? It's a team performance, as you say, uh, the throw-in. And uh, when you concede the first goal, yeah, that, that shouldn't happen. And that's, that's his team, eh? because we don't follow their rules. We don't adapt to a slightly different situation uh, to organise, to keep control in that situation. Five players over the ball and they have a throw-in. That's not possible. We spoke before the game about your ambitions of Europe and how that is so important to this club. How damaging has tonight's result been? Yeah, we know that, especially when you come to the end. But still, we have nine points to play and we have to fight for the nine points. You'll be aware better than anybody, you're very experienced. This result will make headlines all around the world for the wrong reasons from your perspective. Do you still believe that you can turn this team around, given whatever help you can get, given a performance like that tonight? Oh, we, I will keep fighting. And I prepared the team in the best way I, I could do. Uh, it was not good enough, by far not good enough. I have to take the responsibility for that. But uh, I will find energy and I will prepare them for Sunday game. Energy. He said they're underperforming. Uh, these figures from the season more than emphasise that, Paul. I mean, it's quite damning, really for Manchester United. Um, record low points, record high defeats, record high goals conceded, and as you mentioned earlier, record high shots faced. That sums it up, Steve. Um, well, you know, what, can you say, what, what can you say to it? The, what, the one thing I took from the interview was that he, it's, players aren't carrying out the instruction he's, he's given to them. So there, there has to be a big problem there straight away. Look, th 13 defeats in one season for Man United. It's 35 years since that happened. Yeah, it's, um, it's why, they are, why they are in the league. It's just not it's far, from, far from good enough. Um, so easy to play against. I think that's the biggest worry. Difficult night for Paul to watch his former club, but we appreciate you being with us. Thank you very much indeed. Another frustrating night for Eric Ten Hag. A very successful one for Crystal Palace, but for United, the problems are mounting from the three of us. We'll see you soon. Yeah. Leave it at covering, hands covering the mouth. Do me a favour, will you? I mean, I've said it for a long time. You know, I've sat here for mm. quite a while. I've been saying that Ten Hag is just not the right man for this job. I've been saying it for ages and ages. I just want, I mean, he cannot, simply cannot, manage the team next season. 
But I almost wonder now, they've got a cup final and they've got a few important games that could mean European football next year or not. And at some point, you've got to make a decision, right, well, there's nothing... They're going to get absolutely hammered by Manchester City. They're going to get annihilated. In fact, Arsenal will smash them to bits at Old Trafford. Newcastle will probably beat them. And I wouldn't even fancy them going to Brighton either. They might not get anything out the rest of the season if they're playing like that. And I just wonder, with so much at stake, even though it's only for four games, I wonder whether the board might just have to try to do something here and now and be quite radical about it. I'm not sure... But he cannot, simply cannot, manage this team next season. He's not good enough. I've thought it for ages. He's just not good enough to manage Manchester United. And would a performance in the way they've lost tonight like that just even more fuel to people's opinions, like Michael, to that fire? Yeah, look, look it's, it's been a difficult, difficult one, I suppose. I know Michael said he's, he's felt it for a long time and the signs have been there that it's going to be difficult for him to do it next year, but that, that tonight almost felt like a final nail in the coffin, really. Um, you know, there's there's a, a lack of know-how from the team, a lack of effort, which is the big disappointing thing. Going to a, a team like Crystal Palace, look, don't get me wrong, they're a good team, they're doing well, but whatever situation Manchester United, they should be not going there and losing 4-0, it just felt... It felt like the end. Now, if it is the end, I'm not sure, cos what did it do? You know, what, what, what's out there at the minute? I've always felt for a while that he might get another year and work for a club that is steadied down, calmed down a little bit by the new owners, but it just doesn't feel like it now, because I, I felt, who, who's there to replace him? Who is out there? There, there wasn't really anybody... With Thomas Tuchel saying he's he, he's leaving Bayern Munich, I think that's it doesn't create a bigger problem for him because I think the problems are there anyway. I think it's quite plain to see that it feels like borrowed time. And I'm watching that performance tonight. Sometimes you get them performance where you think this this is the end, and, and that almost felt like it. I remember Ollie Gunnar at Watford away. I think it did, did have a similar look to it tonight. It, it felt it felt very similar to me. It just it just fell out the end. But what do you do for the last four games? Michael said, you've got a big cup final. You, you can't see. You can't see where a win's coming from. You, you look at the last three fixtures. Even before tonight, look at the game. You can't see where a well, win. They won one in seven. And I, that was against Sheffield United, the team that have yeah. been, been relegated. They can't beat Burnley at home. Got to try something different. What, 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 I mean, what, 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 I, I, anything. Anything. Steve McLaren? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, we've I, played under Steve McLaren. Yes. We, he's coached us. There is no way, and we had a discussion before, there is no way that his fingerprints are anywhere near I'm that team. Say. He is a brilliant, brilliant coach, and that team Suggested is not you, being not coached at coaching. all. No way, no way. That, that no way Steve me, McLaren is, he, he, is the first team coach. Yeah, he, he's not touching that team. I, I, I don't think... He's the brilliant. manager must not be letting him touch that team because... Everyone thinks we were a great team that attacked everybody and went at people. Sometimes we played against better teams. Steve McLaren put sessions on to make sure you stopped other teams, getting the distances right, getting your angles right, especially in the centre midfield, all across the midfield. And he has got no impression on that team. He's just... Oh, as, well, as I best, played under... He's the best coach I ever had. He's a brilliant, brilliant coach. There is no way on earth, Steve, I'm telling you, that he's got anything to do with coaching that team. No. It's impossible. Because that team is absolutely clueless right the way through it. Right the way through it. There's not one thing that I think that works in that team. I don't rate anything about it. Anything. And, and Steve McLaren is a top operator. And I can only think he's there, you know, you know, there's other people coaching the first team and he's just a bystander. So, so you'd be quite happy if Ten Hag went for, for the last four games, including the cup final, Steve McLaren lead the team? For four games, yeah. And, well, anything. There's, they're going to get smashed out the ballpark by every team they play playing like that today. Manchester City are going to demoralise them at Wembley in front of millions of people. It's embarrassing. That's just embarrassing how they're playing. There, there, Something's not... got to change. I know it's going to change in the summer, but it's got to change. I think it's got to change now. There's too many big games. This could, you know, this is European football next year. This is a trophy at the end of the year. There's not actually that many bad players there, is there? No. Do you know what I mean? Not, it, it looks shape like that team into a lot not better. being coached when it comes to the, the, being the manager's fault. We, we had times when 
I remember Michael Carrick and Darren Fletcher playing centre half at times for us. Three or four times, you lose centre half. So what? It gives you the bigger challenge, you know what I mean? Say, go on, yeah. right, come on, we're, we're more determined, but there's just no. It looks like the fight's gone out of them. Welcome along to another edition of Final Word, the penultimate Monday night football of the season. And Michael, I, we finally got him on. Our good friend, the United legend Paul Scholes, is with us very apt as well because, of course, his former club were playing in the Monday night football, which we'll have reaction to shortly at Selhurst Park. But it was a difficult watch throughout the evening, and from this moment, 12 minutes in, Paul. Yep, difficult match, Steve, as you know, but. But United are for the taking. We, we, we know they had a lot of players missing, especially the back four is really decimated. Casemiro was seen there in at centre half, which was a, a, a really difficult night for him against a, a, a really good Crystal Palace team. And but they were well worthy of the victory tonight. Yeah, probably the worst time to play Crystal Palace at the moment. Their front three all fit and firing. Mateta here with the second goal. Very good strike. Um, Manchester United certainly could have done more to avoid a couple of these goals, but good play as well from Crystal Palace. They were really good tonight. Um, you can just feel the expectation in the crowd, the new managers getting a good tune out of them, they're confident, they've got a fit squad. And that, together with Manchester United underperforming, resulted in a, in a bit of a, a rout, I'd say, Steve, 4-0. And it was nothing more uh, or nothing less than they deserved. I mean, it was, it was quite a true reflection of the game. Casemiro was at fault for, for quite a few of the goals tonight, including this final one. Um, and it wasn't just Casemiro, I thought the goalkeeper could have done better here. Maybe here it looks like a, a great finish, and it was a good finish, but this angle shows it virtually went in the centre of the goal. I thought the goalkeeper, Anana, should have done a little bit better. So, very poor night for Manchester United, but uh, what a fantastic night for the Eagles. Yeah, I think Michael summed up perfectly. Manchester United were, were poor all night long, Casemiro especially. Playing in that defensive role where you make mistakes and your lack of mobility really gets found out. I thought they might have half got away with it at Crystal Palace. It's quite a tight pitch. Johnny Evans as well. But we saw Johnny Evans as well for the second goal, I think it was. All, also got, got done, he dived in as well. So, look, it was an all-round poor performance. Not just the centre half, not just the back four, not just the goalkeeper. The midfield were, were poor as well. The, the centre forward didn't really get a chance. Can't remember Ganacho or Anti create anything. So all round, really bad night for Manchester United, and we'll have to see how they recover from this. Okay, we'll analyse it and get reaction in a moment. But first of all, here is the Manchester United boss, Eric Ten Hag. You've been asked this many times, and I hope you'll understand the question. But given the run of form you're on, given where the club is, and you're still in a cup final, which potentially you could win. If you can get to the end of this season and have a summer, do you believe that you're the right person with the right people behind you to restore Manchester United's fortunes? Uh, uh, absolutely. And if we are, the right players are there, so available, uh, we have a good squad. Uh, but uh, we miss almost the whole back line and then we have problems. Well, we'll uh, respond to that with Paul in a moment. But first of all, you want to go a little deeper into, into Manchester United contributing the ease of which Palace scoring tonight. Yeah, definitely. The first uh, goal in particular um, from a throw-in. Um, and if we just have a, a look at it here, I mean, the player that scores, Elise here, is, is uh, in a position. If you, if you said to, to somebody, the throw-in's going to go to him and he's going to run unchallenged and, and, uh, and score a goal, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, Paul, you played in this, in this position in this central area, how would you have prevented this for, for, for starters? It's very simple. Christian Eriksen has to be 10 yards deeper. If he's 10 yards de deeper, everything stops. Now, I've heard people say possibly Mason Mount's ahead of the ball a little bit. I don't really agree with that. I don't think it matters that much about Mason Mount, because you, as you'll see in a minute if you roll it on, Maynou's there as well. So there yeah. are two centre midfield players. Mason Mount's the one there. And I don't mind that. But if Christian Eriksen goes back 10 yards, he stops that throwing straight away. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, it, if you're broken on that way from a th simple throw in, that is, that is coaching. That's where you should be. And uh, I think the manager actually uh, alluded as well. They did not take the simple instruction I gave them. And that is just about being shaped. It's knowing the position and not letting anybody come in behind you. And also it's communication because surely Chris Casemiro can see him. Christian, drop back 10 yards. Simple. Everything stopped. Me, Maynou, you're happy front covering 
Matata there. Because I'm, you I'm look covering at the that point. Yeah, I, I'm you happy look with at that. Yeah, that's, I'm the, happy. that's the midfield three. Yes. Sorry, not that one. There he is. I'm, I'm quite happy with that, Michael. Although I still think he's a little bit deep. I still yeah. think he can come up, and they're almost on a line. Yeah. Ericsson and, and Manu, then it stops anything go. They're five yards apart from each other. The Christians just drop them ten little, ten little yards, which makes a massive difference that stops that gap. And it's difficult. And to, it's not difficult. It's impossible to get through and help be allowed to do what he, he does after this. Casemiro, of course, we've already mentioned that, that Ericsson is in the wrong place, but yes. can Casemiro spot that earlier and actually squeeze into this and make sure he doesn't yes. turn, stop it at source. That, that's, that's exactly what he has to do. First of all, Casemiro's wrong with lack of communication to tell Ericsson to be back in there, but once it's happened, as... Can you just take it back a little bit, Mike? Yep. Sorry. As he's looking this way, so he, he's looking away from Casemiro, that's when Casemiro has to go there and stop it at source there. But he doesn't, he's, he, he just lies on his, on his backside, really, which he did three or, three or four times tonight. And then it's... Mainu, can Mainu get his mate out of trouble? He, yeah. he, there's actually two mates in trouble. So he, he goes to do it, he looks like it, he almost stops there and gives up. That's, that's ridiculous, that just, that, that cannot happen. You have to go, you have to try and affect it somehow. Give him a little nudge, try and get him off balance or something. Try, try and win the ball. Look, if you give a foul away, you give a foul away. But because Johnny Evans has got nowhere to go there. If Johnny Evans goes out to the ball, people say, yeah, he should be going out to the ball, stop the shot. But if he goes out, it's a little simple pass into one of his wide players, and, and they probably score. So, look, it's a little bit of a scruffy finish in the end, but give Crystal Palace credit, I thought they were brilliant. They were, and let's uh, listen to the man who constructed that plan, Oliver Glasner, talking to his live from Salehurst Park. Oliver, very well done. What a result for you. How pleasing was the way everything came off tonight for you? Yeah, thank you very much. So, I think first half we didn't play really uh, so good. It was we were very efficient. Yeah, we saw I saw also saw now the first goal it, uh, and and the second one was where we what we wanted to do to get a lot of pressure, but we gave them too many passes through our lines and and so it was an an equal game, but we were very efficient and we made some adaptions at half time and in second half yeah we did it really well. So we we got a lot of confidence, got a lot of chances, scored nice goals. But uh, yeah, it, it's um, it, I think. Um, over the whole 90 minutes, we can do it better. OK, um, but Paul and Michael looking at the middle of Manchester United's defence there, that must have been something you looked at tonight. You knew that wasn't going to be their strongest first choice area. Yes, we talked about it before. Um, Man United struggle with a lot of injuries, and, and uh, yeah, we know that uh, uh, maybe they have also we have an advantage in our, with our pace in the offense. So that's why we wanted Michael uh, Olise and, and, and Eze also in the, in the middle of the pitch, so that we have. This, it's very difficult to fend, defend them in one-one situations when they can turn and go face to face on you. So it was always uh, to find this 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 uh, place, uh, the, the the space in the pocket. So this we also didn't. Not so well in first half, much better in second half, and then it's difficult to defend them when they come uh, with the ball on the on their feet and and, and um, because they go left, they go right, they're very quick legs, and and so we know that maybe here we have an advantage, and players did it really well. Oliver, it's Michael Owen here. Congratulations on tonight's result. I just wanted to know, as a, as a, as an attacking player myself. What have you done to the attacking players, in particular Mateta? Because since you've managed him, he is, his, his level has gone to a, a, a different stratosphere. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, the players, you know, it. Uh, the, the players have to do everything themselves. So, uh, yeah, we, we support them, we encourage them. And, and also this situation where he scored the goal, um, we said, yes, when you have the 1-1 the one -one situation, take it. And maybe you lose twice or, or three times the ball, but in the next time you are um, uh, one uh, in front of the keeper, he hit the 1-1 one -one against uh, Evans. We know that we have an advantage with the pace. And then it's, he scored many goals and the finish is amazing. And uh, this is the confidence he, that he has. And you've got a real good, strong three striker, three attacking players there. How important is it for you next year, because it looks like you're building something pretty special, to keep these three together? Oh yes, I'm, I'm really sure that the, the Crystal Palace uh, will do, give, do everything that, uh, to keep all the players. Uh, but you know, we know in football, and now we have a uh, beginning of May, so you never know how the squad is looking like when the next season starts. But yeah, well, they are amazing players. But again, we saw now Michael's uh, second goal. It was a uh, very uh, Daniel Munoz uh, made a lot of pressure on Casemiro, winning the ball back. Uh, 
on the goal line of Man United after we lost it. So, um, and then he is in the position where he can show his quality, his finish. Um, and we talked about it after the Fulham game because he was not so so pleased with himself because he had uh, three, four shots. He always uh, hit the keeper or the shot was blocked. And then we said, maybe you try it uh, in the near post. And uh, he was, he scored. And Oliver, just finally, I mean, you arrived at Palace were five points above the drop zone. They're 17 now. Um, your return. How much are you enjoying the Premier League and, and coaching Crystal Palace? Of course, uh, we have some great results, and it's not so long ago. I'm always, I'm very humble because I know yeah, before the Liverpool game, it was not we couldn't expect to win there, and then uh, we were five points about, uh, above relegation, and yeah, we. we got many players back after injuries and, and this helps. Yeah, We have now much more opportunities uh, also to, to make substitutions like uh, yeah, Jeffrey Schlupper scored the, the equaliser at Fulham last week. So yeah, it makes it uh, easier for us uh, when we have all the, most of the players uh, fit in the squad and uh, yeah, every win, every good performance um, increases the confidence and so yeah, we want to get two more wins until the end of the season and then let's see what happens. Well, very well done tonight. Thanks very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you very much. Oliver Glasner, live from Selhurst Park for you. What a result it was for him and for Palace. But let's get to their second goal again. Yeah. This, is, this is difficult viewing from a United point of view. I think so. I mean, we've had a look at the first goal. I mean, there's, there's not as much wrong with this second goal, but there is, there's a couple of things that I, I do feel. I mean, in this position here for Manchester United, they're in, they're in a decent enough position. I'm thinking one can... Rasmus Holling make a run into this uh, channel. You know, you've, you've got a ball, a steady ball in, in here. That's fine. You know, a safe ball. The other ball is to obviously knock it into the channel. One thing I don't think you should be doing here is Anthony should be running into this situation and, and, and blocking himself. I mean, if I just forward it a little bit and then pause it, this ball now comes into him. He's taken a touch. What on earth can he do here? He's about two, three yards from the touchline. He can only go out of play. He's now got lots of people all chomping at his heels. And he's just basically ran into a cul-de-sac when, it, you know, he's killed the space for his teammate here. I, I just don't know why he, he, would, he would even enter that zone. And all of a sudden, you know, it's clustered. That's exactly what, what Crystal Palace want. Look, four players all, you know, chomping at the heels of Manchester United players. And as soon as the ball breaks, what happens? Every Manchester United player here, they're all out of, you know, they're all out of position. They're all dead. You know, it's 2v2 and then Mateta. And this is another point. This is great play here. I mean, he could make that run, but he doesn't. He actually makes the run to clear Wan-Bissaka away. He takes him away to leave Mateta 1v1. He's got confidence in his uh, striking partner. And he walks past Johnny Evans and then smashes it in the back, back of the net. So just little details like that, Steve. I mean... He, it, it, it's poor play from Manchester United and, and obviously they expose their, their weakness. Yeah, exactly, Michael, as Michael said, I think he actually mentioned it in his interview there that our first thought when we win the ball back, get it forward, get it to people, get it to Mateta, get it to Elise, get it to Eze, and then the, the, he knows there's a big lack of pace in that, in that back line and once he's one-on-one -on -one with Johnny Evans. And Johnny surprised me a little bit because I think Johnny's been good when he's played. Look, again, he's another player who's... Probably getting on a bit and not as quick as he used to be, but a little bit of poor defending there. It's a good finish from the lad and a good goal from their point of view because it would be exactly what, the, what, what they've worked on. Yeah, and then we move on to 3-0, Steve. Um, quite simply, a couple of mistakes. Dallow at the back, Casemiro as well. You know, I'll just highlight them here. We've got Dallow in this position. We've got Casemiro here. Um, you know, and they both basically leave their man eventually. The ball gets cleared out and when it comes back in... Again, you know, you've, you've got this situation here. There's Casemiro on his man. He should be sticking tight. Yes, there's Dallo. He's actually looking at his man as well. You can see he's, he's looking straight at him, but none of them follow. And all of a sudden he gets in, breaks off Casemiro, and it's a, it's a goal. Set piece, just a simple lack of marking, lack of concentration, lack of desire to get there first. And all of the lack in things that Manchester United have, Crystal Palace were quite the opposite. They were desperate to get on the end of it. Once again, too easy to play against? Too easy to play against. Again, um, Dalo at the back post, absolutely daydreaming. He's had a look, as Michael said, he points out. He's seen him, he knows where he is. But when the ball's been hit, he doesn't look again. And, and that's too... I think there was a goal similar there. I think Mo Salah scored a goal yesterday where the, 
the left back didn't look either. Yeah. That, that was a very similar situation. And once he, once he sees that and then the danger's there and thinks, oh, I'm in a bit of trouble, then win it, be more aggressive. Then you can smash the ball away, but it still is too easy to play against. Yeah. Quick look at the last goal as well, Steve. Uh, again, a big mistake from Casemiro. Good play by Crystal Palace, knock it into the channel. Casemiro really has got this covered. He can either play it out, but the one thing you don't do is, is that. Um, Crystal Palace win the ball, drop it back, and it's a, it's a good finish. But this is a really good angle, I think. You see Casemiro, you know, it, you just can't do that. You can't do that at any level, let alone in the Premier League. But this finish, this is a really good angle. I just think Anana here, I'm not sure whether he's got his angles wrong or whatever, but that virtually, I mean, not in the middle of the goal, but it's pretty central. And I'd be expecting my goalkeeper to save that ball. Yeah, it look, he should be saving it. Did. The only defence you do have is that he is expecting to go to that far corner. Of course he is, but and it's it's clever play from from Elise. I thought Elise was brilliant on the night again. Poor from Casemiro, but but the keeper should be should be doing a lot better. As my no, says. no, we saw the United players go over to the fans uh, afterwards as well, and then this as they were coming off, Anthony Mount, a bit of a nana in discussion. What do you make of this? Well, talking behind the mat. I, 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 I have no idea he's got three fingers up there, what, what that means, uh, I, I don't know. He's, he's saying something to Mason Mount he's obviously not happy with. Anana then covers his mouth, says something. Uh, Mason Mount seems the quietest out of the three of them, but what's that going to do? I, I didn't see any of them communicating on the football pitch, as we saw with Casemiro and Eriksen. Um, and there's, it does, that, that doesn't look good. I don't think that's good for the managers. People obviously talking and saying things that they don't agree with when he's, when he's putting them three fingers up. Um, we should be having three midfield. Well, why don't we play three? I, I don't know anything. We've no idea because we can't lip, we can't lip read. But there's obviously a problem, there and they, they obviously don't dis or disagree with mm. something the manager's doing. And Eric Ting Hag said afterwards the players were given a script and they did not follow it. They were given instructions and, and didn't follow it. I think that was mainly the midfield two. That was aimed at our midfield three. Um, so again, do you know what, what, what can you do about that when? When your players aren't following out in your instruction, then you have to be the one to take responsibility. And I think he did that today for the, for the first time, really, in, in a while. I think we, we, we probably all saw the same game that, that he did. And it's a worry that he's asking players to do stuff and, the, and they're not doing them. OK, these figures might just encapsulate the entire season that Eric Ten Hag. Record low points of 58, they're just above um, that, the, below that margin from 21. Record high defeats, 13 in the Premier League era. The last time they lost that many, incidentally, 35 years ago. Uh, 52 scored, the record low was 49. Uh, 55 conceded and, as Paul keeps alluding to, the record high, Michael, 16. At the 618 shots faced this season. Yeah, I mean, those numbers just say it all, don't they? Really, you don't need to add to that. It just all points to a really, really poor team. Um, the, and the question is, what's the next chapter after those figures, after tonight? In my opinion, there has to be a next chapter, yeah. Under Eric Ten Hag? No, 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 no. You know that. You know that. For a long time, I've not felt he's the, he's the right man. He's not getting his message across. The players are not acting on, you know, on what he's saying, if he's saying the right thing. I must admit, when he comes across on interviews, I think, well, would I be acting on what he said? I don't even... You know, a half the time, he's talking in riddles. I'm, I, can't, I'm, I get confused myself. So, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, you know... My decisions made. My decision was made a couple of months ago that I think that Manchester United now they've got you know they're sorting out behind the scenes. It will filter onto the pitch as well, and uh, and I would be astounded if there's not a new manager at the start of next season. I think the bigger question is whether there should be a new manager for the last four games. This is really really important. These last four games, European football qualification and an FA Cup final against Manchester City. The way things are going at the moment, they're going to get embarrassed in all of those games. They, they, they might not get another point. And, uh, and Manchester City at Wembley in front of millions of people, you know, <laughs> that's the big question for me because at the moment it just looks like a sinking ship. You agree? Be a big shout now, wouldn't it, with four games to go? It would, yes. Um, I'm trying to find a way to defend him. If I'm honest, I, I have done for most of the season. It's been very unsettled above him. Um, we know that's probably going to be sorted out now with a bit of luck. It looks like it with Jason. Jason Wilcox coming in, Dan Ashworth coming in, whoever else is coming in, Brailsford. So, obviously there as well. 
But tonight just fell out the end. Um, whether it will be, I, I don't know. I don't think it will be the I think they'll change in the summer. But I think the, it, it's a more of a relevant question whether they change now or they have to change in the summer, in my opinion. It's just a question you, as whether they Do you agree now. with the summer? <sighs> it's hard not to. After, after, after watching that tonight, his only defence he's got players missing, but we, we can't keep saying that. There's been many teams that down the years and, he's got to and take now. Responsibility for oh, players. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think he did goals. do tonight. I think he did. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You can't just say all oh, my players are missing yeah. all the time. Well, you're training them every day. Yeah. And as we said before, the age he's signed these players. You know, as I said before, there must be four or five players. Uh, they're not coming to Manchester United to play 45, 50 games a season, and that's what you need to be successful. These, these are players who, like when I got to 32, 33, 34, your managers say that you play 25 games for this season, but there's enough in round there, because you've been there and done it and I've got the experience, there's enough round to compensate for that. There isn't now, the Manchester United are just not in that position, the club aren't in that position, the players aren't good enough in that position. So to bring them players in, it, it's, it, we've seen, look, it's just, it's just not worked, there's been... Too many players bought are at the wrong age for this football football club. And the, we're talking about quality players. You think of Ericsson, brilliant footballer. Just you saw how, how he struggled tonight mm -hmm. with, when, you, when you're needing a legs and you need an athlete. We, we've seen Casemiro, what a player he's been. And it, it's horrible to have dig these players out and talk about these players because of what they've given to the game. But they should not be at Manchester United now, and that's the big problem of the previous regime bringing these people in. OK, the Manchester United discussion will continue. Indeed, they could have cut it into 11 pieces. They were that good, weren't they? Crystal Palace tonight, they could have all had a bit. There is so much quality with these two lads, Elise and Eze. With them playing like that, Jamie, that's five straight wins than when they've started together for Crystal Palace. Can they hurt any team, never mind a Manchester United side who really are there for the taking tonight? Any team, and you know, you look at the performance last night, uh, tonight for the two of them, and I think they could almost play for anyone, you know, in this league. I really do. And there's talk actually Manchester United, you know, at least they being their top target for the summer, you could understand why. Uh, I was actually thinking then in terms of Crystal Palace, and he always used to go to uh, Wilfred Zaha, and he was always down, we spoke about when he was missing, what the results were when he played, and he was fantastic for Crystal Palace. Maybe the best player they've had in the Premier League era. I actually think these two are better. Maybe haven't had the longevity of Zaha at Crystal Palace. And that is the next key question. Will they have that longevity? Because if Crystal Palace want to go from being that, they're almost a typical mid-table club. They always get the same amount of points, finishing Between the same. 10th and 15th, as we Perfect. said earlier. You know, and listen, that's a success story on its own. But if they want to go forward a little bit, and I understand the nature of the club, they bring players in for cheap, like these two players from lower league and sell for big money. They can't afford to lose both of them. They might, in the summer, have a really big bid and they go again in the lower leagues if they've still got Dougie Friedman, who was an absolute master at buying players in the lower leagues. We've seen that with Wharton from Blackburn. But these two are two superstars and uh, I hope, I hope they both stay. I do, because well, I, mean, I love watching isn't them it? play. Because it's a big test for the football club now. They yeah. have, as Jamie said earlier, a, a manager with real pedigree who's won European trophies who's probably going to challenge the club himself and say, what can we do next year? How can we kick on? And surely the test has got to be, can you keep these two talents at the football club? I think that's the main thing for, for the manager. He wants to keep the, the two best talents at the football club, and that's going to be massive come this, this summer. You keep them, and then obviously he's going to start to look for next season and look to see where Crystal Palace can actually get to, how high on the table they can get to. Are they just going to be happy with just being a mid-table team? Like I say, the manager won a European competition. He's going to want to see Crystal Palace getting, getting up there. And with these two players in the team, you know, it's vitally important that he holds on to them. We're talking about the, from the point of view of Crystal Palace and their supporters in the club, but also as, as individuals. You've known this yourself, Ashwin. You, you end up getting to Manchester United where you start off at Watford, but even though you love the club and you're playing well, you, you want to progress. These are two players who can play Champions League football. Or certainly European football, without a doubt, and they're going to want to do that. It might be hard for them to do that at Crystal Palace. So the, the, the players' uh, intentions will be as important as, as the club's really, and you couldn't be moaning if one of them wanted to move on if they get a big offer from a club in the Champions League. But the early signs are really good under Oliver Glasner. Four wins out of five now for Palace, and we can hear from the man himself with David Craig. Out fighting, hasn't he, Eric Ten Hag? Is it a bigger problem than the coach right now, Ashley? I think obviously a lot is going to be said about the manager and 
and what he's, what he's been doing. I think the players themselves, with a performance like tonight, with the season, how it's been going, they've got to stand up and, and take and, and be counted, really, because it's, it's on them to go out on the pitch and, and what, produce. What's the minimum requirement when you're playing for Manchester United? To work hard for the badge, to run for the badge. You know, the fans expect teams to go and play exciting, attacking football, and you're just not seeing it. It's just not there. With the group of players that are available right now, would changing the coach now or in the summer achieve anything? This is, this is one of the most poorly coached teams in the Premier League. That's a fact. That's not an opinion, that's a fact. The numbers tell you that when you see them bottom of the league defensively. Lower than Sheffield. say again, I, his whole back line has been unavailable. No, no I, listen, I get that. I totally understand that. And your performance level will drop and your results will not be as good and you miss your best players. That is the most obvious thing to say. But I've said this for a while with Eric Ten Hag, that it's almost the opposite of what you'd say with most managers. You say he needs a result. Eric Ten Hag needs performances. He needs a belief that we don't... OK, we know we're struggling, we're losing players, it's not a great time, the structure of the club is not right, we get all that. But you've got to make us believe there's something here, we're working to something. OK, you might... I, I struggle to see how United will win tonight, I said that to you before the game, but I thought Palace might win 1-0, 2-1, tight game, but they, they just get over the line. No Manchester United team should be getting beat 4-0 by Crystal Palace. Manchester United's under-23 team, if they are at Manchester United and they've come through their academy, they've been coached and teached and taught to play and played in that game, I'd still expect them not to lose 4-0. It's just, it, it is, and I've, I've never been a coach or a manager, but I've been a player and I've been coached by some top coaches and some of the things I see are just wrong. Let's have a look at the, the things you might be talking about then. It, it seems like Eric Ten Hag himself was... Um, Pretty unhappy with what he saw from the sideline in well, terms of his own team's defending. Yeah, in his interview there, he said something about on the left about five players. Now I'm not sh I'm not sure if he's talking about the back four and Manu in front or the actual almost like five players around here. So we're not sure exactly what he means. But when I say some things are wrong, that is wrong. And even though I've never managed or coached a team in my life, I would argue night and day with Eric Ten Hag, that is wrong. Because there's no way in the world that ball will ever go there. So Eriksson's got to come in here to protect his defenders, and if the ball does go there, he, by the time the ball's thrown, he can get there. That is wrong. Now, Maynou goes in front. Now, of course, what is Wan-Bissaka doing there, just doing nothing? He could easily go in there, and Maynou could go in there. But again, leadership, organisation, again... No one taking responsibility. And then Ericsson just gets thrown to the floor. Casemiro is just a joke, hasn't he, tonight? I mean, how does he run that far without anybody getting near him? Are there any basics? Just stop it there, please, Jamie. Are there any basics, actually? You're playing at left back, say, or left wing back, as you have done so many times. When you're facing a throw in on that side, in terms of defensive setup, you're expecting to, to be set up and have a set up in this position. Whether the five boys further forward, you're expecting them to, to communicate, get them back in. If they've, Crystal Palace throw the ball backwards, then you can get up the pitch, they're not going to harm you here. But when you vacate this big space, it's, like I said, it's just crazy I mean, to, to leave that much. Spin. People are not marking, people are not talking. He's a young player. He thinks he's doing a good job. He, he's trying to protect, he's trying to help. You've got wan Bissaka and Johnny Evans here, really experienced players. They've got to be telling him to go away. What is wan Bissaka doing there? Now, a throw in down the line, we always know what you do. Someone gets in front, someone gets behind. You block the ball going into the feet so he can, he's an easy pass back to the thrower. So you try and pen them in. I mean, Maynou, listen, he's in a, doesn't, it's not a great position. And he thinks he's trying to help. There's two experienced players there. They've got to help him, tell him to move. And Wan-Bissaka's got to get involved. It's lovely footwork, though, from that point, actually. Oh, it is. And, you know, as soon as Elise gets it to feet, he knows exactly what he wants to do. He knows Casemiro is coming, he's going to do some quick feet and then he's going to start opening up and driving towards the box. To be honest, I think Johnny and Diogo Dalot leave too much of a gap there for Elise to, to exploit and, you know, he exploits it magnificently well. I mean, there's something I've got to point out on this goal and I, and I know people will think maybe I'm just pointing the finger, but well, well, Casemiro obviously gets done. A really poor challenge. Just keep an eye on Casemiro here. 
So he's by the referee now, he's running back, obviously it's gone past him. I just wanted to see his reaction when the goal goes in. He actually looks like he's blaming somebody else. Just keep an eye on him. So the ball goes in, it's poor from, you know, four or five players. Look at him putting his arms out, either Dallow, Evans. He then, I mean, look at the screen. He's looking at the bench. I mean... I just want to point something else out on this goal as well, Jamie. If we see this run through, let's take you to the Crystal Palace crowd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we saw this. This is a great reaction. You see the reaction? You need to do the close-up. <laughs> and she is going to have the best TikTok in the morning. Roll it on. <laughs> Look at the reaction. <laughs> that's Stewart's a man you fan isn't it? <laughs> brilliant let's have a look at the second that that is listen it's a you look at that as a great goal but that should not go in and I said at half time he's got to bring Casemiro off now I know he's got kids on the bench but I think Casemiro deadly serious should know himself tonight as an experienced player that he should only have another three games left at the top level. The next two league games are a cup final, and then he should be thinking, I need to go to the MLS or Saudi. I'm, I'm, I'm deadly serious. His, his, his agents or the people around him, they always have a, you know, a team of people around them. They need to tell him this has to stop because we are watching one of the greats of the modern time playing in one of the best midfields we've seen who dominated Europe. Him holding Cruz to one side, Modric to the other, was one of the best midfields, could, could easily go up against the, the Barcelona midfield that we all love, the Busquets, Xavi, Iniesta. So he's been an absolute great. I am nowhere near on a level of what that man has achieved. Champions League, playing for Brazil, playing for Real Madrid. But I always remember something when I retired myself, and there was a saying I always remember, as a footballer, leave the football before the football leaves you.